Welcome back to Investing Wizards. I have the pleasure of having Cuppy from Praetorian Capital. How's it going, Cuppy? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, uh, really excited to have you on. I've heard you on a bunch of other podcasts and uh, heard your views. So this is awesome. I get to ask you some questions. Maybe you could just give us a quick intro about kind of uh, what you do. So I run a hedge fund. We're almost 200 million of AUM now. Uh, it's uh, year four for us. We've put up some pretty amazing numbers. Uh, and that, that's what I do. It's, it's a hedge fund. <laughs> what, what was your performance last year? Oh, we were up over 100 uh, net. It was a good year. That's amazing. That's amazing. We did, we did the same in 20 also. So, And this year started off pretty solid also. So it's been good. Uh, it's that's been good. Pretty good when other hedge funds have, have uh, kind of not, not seen as good of a performance last year in particular. Um, that's awesome. Are there any special, uh, specific sectors you focus on or... No, I'm a generalist. I go anywhere, do anything. I'm just looking for alpha. I like to say that I'm an inflection investor. Uh, that, that means I look for sectors that have been uh, forgotten about, sectors that are hated, sectors that are you know cheap. And I try to find some inflection in that sector and catch it right as it's inflected. Uh, I'm often looking at cyclical businesses. I'm looking at uh, secular change in businesses, individual companies. And I, I usually overlay this with an event-driven uh, strategy to help uh, produce some extra alpha and really target those inflections. Cool. I'm, I'm so glad that you didn't say that you're a contrarian, even though it sounds like you're a contrarian, Ben. But... I'm a contrarian like all my friends are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like everyone else, I'm a contrarian. Uh, perfect. Well, um, I think the most interesting thing here is to go right into your views and trade ideas. So let me share my screen and pull up Coifin. So let's start off maybe with um, some sector exposure. So I'm just going to go down here and I'm going to pull up all the sector performance uh, maybe over the past three years. And so this is like a, a way zoomed out view where tech over the past three years is outperforming. And then all the other guys here are a little bit clumped together. But if you look at it over the past one year, you have this real big rally in energy. Um, maybe kind of from a thematic level, what, what's the most interesting to you right now? I think energy is by far the most interesting. Uh, you know, uh, in the end, uh, commodities are very basic. It's supply and demand. And when uh, you use more than you produce of it, eventually the price goes up to incentivize production. What, what, what's different this cycle versus other energy cycles is that uh, you have this ESG thing. And it's really made it difficult for energy companies to increase production. I mean, it's made it difficult for them just to, you know, tread water with current production. Uh, they're just cut off to, from capital and you know, it's been much more difficult to get permits and supplies and manpower and everything else. And uh, I, I think this trend is just starting. It's an exciting trend. Uh, you know, you, if you look at energy and I don't know if you can pull it up, if you can look at an energy versus the S&P, uh, you, you can see just how dramatic uh, the underperformance of energy has been for the last decade. Yeah, so let's pull up, uh, let's pull up S&P 500 here. And I'm actually going to do the relative performance of uh, energy versus SPY. And then uh, let's see here. I'm going to put. Sorry to put you on the spot. Nuts. This is, this is what it's for. We get to show people how to use the platform. So we have, uh, let's move this up a little. And we're actually going to combine energy and SPX. And then we're going to make them on separate charts. And then look at it over the past. 10 years. And so really setting this up to how we want to look at it. So let's see here. Cool. So uh, SPX is kind of like the, the, uh, the, the dark blue line. XLE is the light blue line. <laughs> and this is the relative performance of XLE versus SPY. So uh, it's just been crushed. It's just been crushed. And let's look at it over the past 20 years. So you have uh, since 2008, you have pretty much an, uh, an underperformance for uh, almost 15 years. Yeah. And when people talk about you know, the last six months, or maybe the last year being great for energy, and they say, oh, it's overdone, I missed it. When you look at this, you can realize just how much more catch up energy has. And you know, there's been a couple of pretty long uh, energy cycles in uh, the last 50 years. And they tend to last, you know, five, seven years, and there's like a 10 year bear market, and then it starts again. This is just, you know, supply and demand. It, you know, when, when people make decisions to go look for energy today, it doesn't show up for a couple of years, and then it all shows up as everyone does it. And that's why this sort of like sign curve between, you know, S&P and energy is repeatable, reliable, just a great way to make money. 
And if we pull up the price of oil here, CL1, as just a way to uh, look at that as well. Let's see, it's on here. So, so, the, so kind of the price of oil follows a, a not a similar path, but kind of peaking here in 2008 um, as this. Oops, I'm just going over this as this relative performance peaks, and so we were sort of flat uh, for a long time, and then obviously had. Uh, what was the thing in 2014? What was this catalyst that so, sort of put? Well, uh, U.S. shale came on and that started you know, a few years earlier, but U.S. shale just kept producing and producing and eventually it produced too much and the OPEC panicked and they opened the floodgates. They didn't want to subsidize the guys in Texas and uh, you know, the price of oil collapsed. I think what's really interesting though is that whereas the price of oil has made it all the way back to uh, you know, 90 or 100, wherever you, you want to flag it today, uh, the the XLE versus SPY has not recovered yet, and you know I, I think that's a huge opportunity. That's kind of interesting. So so you're basically like looking at at this point, and the last time we were at 100 was sort of 2014, which was over here, and and we still have a long ways to go until that happens. Um, I think it's a long way to go. Yeah. So what is so you mentioned ESG and you mentioned some of these like drillers, and obviously they don't want to drill when oil price at 30, 40, 50. But I think now people are coming to the consensus or the conclusion that oil prices will remain elevated for a long time. Why aren't these um, drillers, these shale companies um, who, who have been sort of stung before, but I think now have maybe a little bit uh, more comfort that prices will remain high. Why aren't they drilling for more oil? Why won't supply respond, let's say in the next six to 12 months? Can you pull up a crude curve going out uh, 10 years of crude futures? Uh, yeah, we don't have curves on here, but uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Basically, what's happening with the curve is go out a few years and it's not 90, it's 70. And, uh, you know, all the guys in the Permian used to say that the break even was 35 and they were lying. The real break even was like 50 or 60. And uh, now you have the price of steel, labor, cement, uh, you know, every component is doubled in price or tripled. So those guys that were kind of breaking even at 50 and 60, now they're breaking even at like 70. And so that you're not going to drill a well and uh, break even at it. And if you can't hedge it out, you know, a couple of years, you're not going to produce it. Uh, and, you know, in the past, what they did was they raised uh, speculative capital and convertible bonds. They went to the banks and now uh, that, that, that capital is shut off from them. So they actually have to use cash flow to uh, fund it. And, uh, you know, they're not going to use cash flow and fund something that doesn't make any money. And so uh, they're not doing it. You need higher prices, especially because the banks and ESG I mean, have cut them off from capital. Got it. So it's, so it's kind of like cost inflation leading to higher break even um, and just more um, higher cost of capital because of, of ESG and a reluctance to. Uh, yeah, there we go. Up. The curve. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what used to happen is guys would uh, go do a convertible and they drill holes and lie about it because, uh, you know, oil men like drilling holes. Uh, <laughs> and, and lying. <laughs> yeah, and lying. I mean, I like making money. They like lying. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they, they drilled all these uneconomic wells, but net net, uh, the supply of uh, energy increased quite dramatically in the U.S. And now that they have to actually use cash flow, they don't really have much cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um. Got it. So, uh, so that's a, that's a so that's a pretty interesting dynamic. Do you have do you have like a sense? Um, I, I don't know if you have like a forecast, but if we're at hundred hours right now, like what are what can we see over the next year in terms of um, distribution of of price? Where do you think oil price could go? Well, I think it's going much higher. I mean, Biden uh, is releasing the SPR. Uh, I always thought the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was meant to be used in an emergency. You know bad polling numbers isn't an emergency. And uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a real tactical mistake by America to release that uh, petroleum reserve now when we're going to need it in the future. And uh, the net result is they're going to have to fill it at some point. So you have a forever bid under the market once they're finished draining it. And I think the price is going to go much higher. I think it goes to a couple hundred because no one's really increasing production. OPEC doesn't have any spare capacity and global demand keeps growing. Uh, in the end, 6 billion people want the same standard of living and same uh, energy usage per capita that uh, a billion people in the West have. And remember, a lot of these 6 billion people don't even own a refrigerator. They don't own an air conditioner. Uh, you have huge increases coming as their standard of living increases. 
And we're right in the S curve of uh, energy usage per capita in a lot of these countries. And I think you can see very steep uh, growth in energy demand at a time when there's no real supply uh, increases. And it's going to take a much higher uh, energy price to finally stop that demand growth or incentivize new supply. So if we if we look at uh, like the XLE uh, ETF in terms of its its composition um, and look at the largest companies, so the largest companies are the integrated uh, companies Exxon and Chevron. And then can you just tell us maybe a little bit of the subsectors, like how should we think about the energy sector and the different companies that that comprise it? These are the the subsectors, but maybe you have a, a view on on how the uh, supply well, chain works. I mean, when you look at the the big holdings, I mean, look. You have Exxon, you have Chevron. I mean, these guys aren't really increasing production. I mean, if anything, they just walked away from a bunch of Russian assets. <laughs> like, and that, that's going to cut uh, global production because the Russians don't have the technological capacity to really uh, produce out of these uh, fields. Uh, plus, they're sort of cut off from the world in terms of capital and everything else. Um, I don't know these companies very well. I haven't put a lot of time into the energy names themselves. My view of energy uh, producers is that you're betting on geology, you're betting on uh, the price of oil, which is, you know, if you want to bet on the price of oil, you buy some futures. Uh, you're, you're betting on uh, corporate governance and m and because all these guys like buying other people and overpaying. It, it, it's just not a good place to be. I mean, over long cycles, these guys haven't created any value. I mean, pull up a 20-year chart of Exxon. You know, oil went to past 100 you know, it went down almost ne- you know, negative for a bit. But I mean, over 20 years, it's really produced no value. And uh, look, I mean, great. It, 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 uh, it's up three times in 20 years from the, from the lows in the 2002 uh, economic crisis. And you got a little bit of a dividend along the way. But yeah, I mean, well, go back to the 70s and these guys actually wanted to make money. Now they're just doing ESG stuff. Uh, I mean, it, it's controlled by ESG. <laughs> like activists. But um, I mean, this isn't how you make money, really. You don't buy these big lumbering things. I mean, what I like is the energy services much more. Um, if I know anything about uh, energy companies, when they have some money, they're going to waste it. And I want to be, you know, the place they're wasting it. Uh, pull up a ticker of uh, Valaris. Uh, Valaris. V-A-L. V-A-L. Yeah. So this is a company that just came out of bankruptcy. Um, when you come out of bankruptcy, uh, a lot of things happen. In bankruptcy, you get rid of uneconomic contracts. You get rid of a ton of staffing you don't need. You get rid of a bunch of debt. When Valeris came out of bankruptcy, it traded at 10 cents the dollar of the equipment. Valeris is the world's largest owner of offshore uh, drilling equipment. And it, you bought this steel that was floating at 10 cents the dollar of the replacement cost. Of course, replacement cost has gone up a ton because the price of steel has gone up. Uh, you know, just, I mean, a lot of this equipment was built uh, six to 10 years ago. It's more expensive to build it today. But just based on what the cost of was to build, it was trading at 10 cents of the dollar. It had more cash than debt. It was profitable. Uh, it was hard not to make money. And of course, uh, as uh, the price of oil went up, my thesis is starting to play out. I mean, people sort of know where the uh, oil is onshore, but the real growth is going to be offshore because, you know, in the U.S., you can't get pipelines approved. It's hard to get drilling permits approved. There's going to be excess profits taxes and there's going to be carbon taxes and all sorts of other stupidity that's meant to hold back uh, these energy companies, increase the price of energy. But um, when it comes to offshore, you know, you could take a rig. And I mean, a lot of the big discoveries are uh, offshore Brazil or it's Guyana or it's West Africa. And they're going to just move these rigs to the countries that treat capital the best. And, they're going to find uh, really interesting deposits that no one really knew were there. And I think most of the incremental growth is going to come uh, offshore. So I want to own the guy that owns the most of this equipment. And as this equipment gets reactivated and starts earning uh, returns on capital, you know, I think this goes to a couple hundred dollars. Um, <clears throat> a couple hundred dollars. Wow. So, uh, and it's trading at 53. So $4 billion market cap. Uh, it's got about half a billion dollars worth of debt. Uh, so not that much. Debt. How much do they have kind of like before? What were they called before bankruptcy? Well, it was called Valaris. It, Valaris is a merger of multiple uh, poorly managed and poorly integrated uh, companies that all got merged together right before bankruptcy. It was like, uh, you know, the, the drunk leaning on the drunk and <laughs> eventually collapsed. But, um, you know, being large gives you massive scale in terms of, uh, you know, leveraging SGA, leveraging uh, OPEX and 
You know, it came out of bankruptcy. You know, you look at the capital structure has more cash than debt. It's cash flow positive right now. I think positive cash flow really should accelerate in the second half of the year as, you know, they've been using some cash to remobilize rigs. But once those rigs get going and uh, it's just going to print money. And then, of course, as rig rates go up, uh, it's really going to print money. You know, it came out of bankruptcy and a deep water rig was doing about 200000 a day, which is sort of cash break even and, you know, uh, you know, a gap income negative. But, you know, we're already past 300 a day. And I, I think, you know, it, it gets the old highs. The old highs are about five, 600000 a day. And, you know, when you look around the world, I can't think of a single asset that, you know, hasn't taken out the prior highs. I mean, we have ra- rampant inflation. I mean, why can't rig rates get to a million? I mean, I'm not saying that's my target, but why can't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can't think of anything else that hasn't taken up the old highs. Yeah, it makes that definitely makes sense that it would that would make a new high relative to history. Um, and then, how do you think about Valeris relative to some of these other competitors? So, Rig is probably the largest one, uh, but Neighbors and, and some of these other ones. So, I mean, I just treat it based on the equipment. Um, you know, in the end, you're buying uh, steel, you're buying equipment, uh, and I'm looking at it on EV to equipment value. Of course, you know. Uh, gap financials won't capture the value of the equipment. You really need to go, uh, you know, rig by rig and say, what do you think this is worth? And you know, debits and credits based on, you know, is it activated or not? And you know, how long if it's been uh, cold stacked, how long it's been cold stacked for and you know, specification between a six gen and a seven gen rig. And, you know, there's a lot of gives and takes. A company like uh, Transocean, they have quite a, you know, impressive backlog, which, you know, obviously helps uh, the, uh, the, the value of the rig, because that backlog, if it's above market, gets added, whereas Diamond Offshore has a backlog that's below market. It gets debited from the value. But in the end, it, that's all kind of short-term stuff, and I'm focused on the value of uh, the equipment on an enterprise value basis. Polaris is by far the cheapest. Uh, I, I'd say, you know, NE is probably second, uh, you know, in terms of valuation. Uh, I don't know if you have it. Uh, Tickers NE. Um, um, yep, NE. And that came out of bankruptcy also about six months ago. And, um, you know, similar situation uh, came out of bankruptcy. Here's another thing I should talk about with bankruptcy, which I think is really interesting. When companies come out of bankruptcy, they come out of bankruptcy with, you know, improved operations. So compare these guys to Transocean that didn't go bankrupt. But I think the other really interesting thing is that the uh, CEOs and management stock options and RSUs and everything else usually get priced based on the first couple of days of trading. So there's a lot of incentive not to talk a lot in, until these things get priced. And so there's, there's never any, uh, you know, investment research, no analyst reports. Uh, you know, Valeris came out of bankruptcy. They didn't even have a corporate deck. You know, they, they wanted no one to know about it until the stuff got priced for management. And so, you know, you have these situations. Plus, you have a lot of banks that end up owning these shares. Banks don't want to own shares. Insurance companies get equitized. No one wants to own these shares. So you have this period of time where, you know, the shares kind of trade in a tight range as uh, former debt owners sell. And then eventually it starts going up. And you, know, you see this uh, very clearly with uh, Noble. And, um, you know, the stock's starting to go up now that we've cleared out a lot of those debt holders. So Noble's probably the, the second best in terms of valuation, you know, uh, whereas Transocean, uh, you know, is, is insolvent technically. It has more uh, debt right now than uh, assets. But, you know, they, it can crawl itself out of that mess if uh, rates uh, recover or, you know, it, it might not. They're, they have a pretty active ATM right now, which is diluting shareholders. Uh, I guess that's how people could view it. But uh, at, at the t- same time, uh, you know, if you raise uh, equity at four dollars and your shares are worth negative, then it's all creative. Yeah. I, I mean, just as you're as you're talking about kind of like the valuation, the growth rates, I'm just looking at high level for Noble. Um, they're expected to grow like get to about $2 billion of sales. Uh, but then EPS is going from $1.75 to four thirty on consensus. Um, so if you're, if you kind of incorporate these numbers into the valuation, they're trading at less than 10 times. Um, and I just looked at the estimate, yeah. estimate trends and they've started to come up, but uh, probably, probably have more room to, to come up just based on what the oil price has been doing. Yeah. I'd say I'm a lot more optimistic here than the analysts. <laughs> You know, I think it's you know going to earn. And the thing with uh, rigs, and we've seen this each cycle, they don't get valued on current earnings. What happens is you take the number of rigs, you take the most recently contracted day rate anywhere in the world, and you just take your Excel spreadsheet and you drag and drop, and you figure out what the cash flow is. And uh, so analysts aren't going to look at you know a bunch of legacy contracts from two years ago how they bleed forward. 
like you'll look at the most recently signed contract and I think you get a number that's well beyond four. Hmm. Um, do you actually have uh, like, do you have an estimate for, for earnings for Noble and Valeris? Yeah, but you'd probably laugh at me. <laughs> no, I think they each trade at like one or two times, like 24 cash flow. Wow. Um, but, you know, I, I also think day rates do a lot better. Yeah. Huh. Um, cool. That's awesome. So bullish on energy, the way to play it in the services sector, uh, Valeris and Noble are the cheapest ones. What else are you thinking about? Well, I also like Tidewater in that sector, and they're uh, the largest player in uh, OSV is TDW. And that's also a bankruptcy emergence. Uh, I think it merged in 2016, 15. But, yeah. uh, you know, it, the stock price really hasn't woken up since uh, it, 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 it didn't really wake up until quite recently when demand for OSVs really recovered. And this is a little bit uh, more of a small cap stock under a billion dollars. Right. But the, it, it's the biggest player in OSVs. Uh, you know, I think the replacement cost of the equipment is like four or five billion. What's, have, what's, what's OSB stand for? Uh, offshore supply or offshore support vessel. Mm, got it. Um, cool. Okay. Well, a uh, couple of names here to think about. Any other themes that you're thinking about? Well, my favorite theme is uranium. Uh, there's just nothing else that excites me right now. Um, I, I think it's the best uh, trade on the screen by far. And I've been saying this uh, for about six months now. Uh, I'm just kind of obsessed. <laughs> what, what's, what, what is your, uh, doesn't look like we have any uranium commodity pull, data. Pull, pull up a U hyphen U in uh, Canada. Uh, or so a, you, you, it's called uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. You might find it that way. Just... Sprott, two T's, Sprott. Oh, Sprott. Physical, Sprott uh, Physical Uranium Trust. Huh. Let me see if I can do it in the advanced search here. Uh, so it would be, let me see if I can find, if there's another security, maybe it's Sprott. Try S-R-U-U-F, that's the US only. Yeah, yeah that, that should get you too. That, that's the U.S. price. Got it. Okay. Um, it's less liquid, but it's the U.S. version. Um, in, in any case, um, look, if you have a commodity, we just talked about this with oil, and uh, you use more than you produce, eventually the price goes up to get people to produce more. Uh, it's been a 10-year, 12-year bear market in uranium. Uh, it's been below the cost of production for quite a while. There's a 30 million pound uh, deficit each year, and eventually they ran out of uh, supply in the warehouses. Uh, and the price has started to re recover. Uh, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust just owns uranium. And uh, what uh, I think is really interesting about it is that it has a uh, very active uh, ATM in place uh, at the market offering. And every day it sells shares and it buys more uranium. And so what it's doing is effectively cornering the market in uranium. And uh, as it continues to do that, uh, the, the supply of uranium in warehouses will be diminished. And eventually the price will recover to a level where they restart mines as, as they have been. Uh, but, you know, there's still not enough uh, new supply coming because there's plenty of uh, nuclear power plants uh, in uh, Asia coming online. And the net result is there's still a pretty big deficit. And as we know, deficits get cured by higher prices. And so uh, I think this is going to keep going higher until it gets to a price where, um, you know, new, new mines come online. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my favorite trade because, you know, when you have these smaller commodities, especially one like uranium, you know, in oil, the price goes up and people start using less of it. In, in uranium, when the price goes up, no one really cares. It's like one or two percent of the price of uh, electricity. It doesn't matter. Uh, and you're not going to take your nuclear power plant offline just because the price went up. So, you know, demand is pretty constant. And so people will eventually pay some crazy price for the uranium because they need it for their power plants. And, uh, you know, it, it, you, you won't have the same uh, feedback mechanism of supply demand. It's just like the demand is always there. So I just really like this commodity and I think it's going much higher. What is there, um, it, it, is your thesis based at all on new power plants being built or is it just kind of like the current setup? It, it's a current setup. I mean, I think I have a shorter term view. I mean, I'm not investing for the next 20 years, but, um, you know, look, there's a lot, bunch of power plants coming online over the next five years. Uh, they all need uh, uranium. 
uh, there's a handful of mines coming online. The, there's going to be a really bad uh, supply demand uh, deficit. Meanwhile, Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is buying a million, sometimes two million pounds in a week. And the world produces about 150 million pounds of this stuff. And we use about 185 million. It, 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 you know, if Sprott's out there and buying a third to half of global production, uh, it's going to be a problem for the price and it'll eventually get resolved higher. And what are they doing with the, with the uranium once they buy it? Oh, they, they just simply stockpile it. They, they, they never sell. They only buy. So the, it just sits in a warehouse somewhere? Yeah, it just sits in a warehouse. And um, you know, like I said, I don't think this is something you want to own for the rest of your life. I mean, the marginal, I mean, uranium is up from 31 six months ago to about 63 today. Um, you know, when it starts getting into the 60s, uh, mines start uh, turning back on because it gets profitable to produce it. So with a lag and if enough mines come back on, there'll be a glut like there was that, you know, lasted a decade and the price went down to 25. So, you know, this is a cyclical commodity, but we're in the up cycle now. And I think the cycle lasts a few years. What um, outside of the uranium trust, are there any stocks to play it that you like? Not really. I mean, that's part of the, the problem with uh, uranium is really not a lot of companies that produce it. Um, you know, the, the one that I own is a company called Kazatomprom. The, the ticker is KAP in uh, London. And why yes. and, and, and why this one versus some of the other more liquid ones like CCJ? Oh, because uh, Kazatomprom is the world's largest producer. They're the, by far the lowest cost producer. Uh, they're growing their production uh, quite rapidly. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking about 7 million more pounds in uh, 23 that they're going to add. Um, you know, Kaz Adam Prom could add uh, quite a lot of pounds over time. Uh, and, um, you know, if you're the low cost producer, you have a lot of cash flow, you pay a nice dividend. This company has a quite an attractive dividend. Uh, you take some country risk, it's in Kazakhstan, but uh, so far corporate governance has been great, I think. And I think the guys running it are doing a decent job. Whereas Cameco, they have very high cost mines uh, and they're just going to, really terrible competitive position because if they turn on their minds, uh, it, it, think of this think of Cameco like shale where uh, Kazatomprom is OPEC. If uh, Cameco brings on too much supply, uh, Kazatomprom with about a two-year lag just gluts the market again and then Cameco is forced to shut down their minds, which has already happened once. And um, the net result is in, in a duopoly because these two are you know disproportionate percentage of global production. You want to own the, the lower cost operator. Uh, you know, Cameco also is short a bunch of uranium. They have a bunch of other you know, dumb problems. They, they pre-sold a lot of uranium at terrible pricing, so they're not going to get much of the benefit of the upsides of the price of uranium. It, it's just like a mismanaged sort of mess of a company. And so this is a, a London listed. Uh, these are London listed shares. There's nothing trading in the US. So any investor who wants to buy them would have to buy them kind of like the UK shares. But all the resources or all the assets are located in Kazakhstan? Correct. And how did you like? Um, how did you get comfortable with the with the country risk? Like, has there ever been um, um, any sort of uh, governance or nationalization issue in Kazakhstan? Uh, look, you take country risk. I bought into this thinking it was a C country about to get upgraded to a B. Uh, and six months after I bought it, uh, they had a change of government. They had some riots. They, you know, there's a new guy in charge now. It's going to be a C, probably downgraded to D sort of country, especially with Russia causing a mess everywhere. Uh, and that's going to impact the valuation. It's why, you know, you could buy this for, you know, this is a $50 stock uh, four months ago. And today we're at 30. Uh, you could buy this a lot cheaper now, even though the price of uranium is up because uh, you know, it, it, this is more country risk. Uh, am I comfortable with Kazakhstan? I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's just it's not the sort of thing you want to make, you know, a massive position. But, you know, we own some of it. Uh, in the end, there's really no good options if you want to have exposure to uranium. And you know, going back to my, my comment on XLE a while ago, I don't usually like producers, but you know, I think this is a double digit dividend yield uh, at today's uranium price, and they uh, are going to pay me my dividend. And I think eventually I'll get uh, paid an OK value. Um, yeah, I think it's more like a 15% dividend yield at today's uranium. Uh, that, that, that's last year's. They do one dividend each year. So it, it's based on the price of uranium. But um, yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's you, you, you take certain risks to get certain upsides. I don't. I don't really know. I, I, I certainly like uh, the Sprott entity better. And, and and so any so you're saying kind of like most of the uranium companies out there. So CCJ is probably the biggest one. I know Denison is one that's sort of 
punt it yeah, around. Denison's not really a uranium company. They they have some very you know this it's, it's like a very speculative uh, trading thing. They don't produce uranium. It's uh, and the assets they have are mediocre at best. It's it's just, it's just meant for day traders. And yeah, you know when uranium gets in the news, it probably goes up that day or that month, and maybe it goes to a couple of dollars. But I mean, look at the valuation of this thing. You know, uh, Kaz Adam Prom is like seven billion valuation. It's the world's biggest producer. This thing's like a two billion valuation, a billion five. It has a billion uh, four valuation, billion three seven value uh, enterprise value. They don't produce anything. They don't do anything except produce press releases. Right. Um, <laughs> ten, ten and million. then you know, you can compare that to Kaz Adam Prom, which is five times larger and uh, is producing like a quarter of the world's uranium. It's kind of crazy, right? The, 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 the disparity. Big, big uh, country discount. So this is trading at EV to sales of, of 100 or, or something along the I don't lines. think they sell anything. I don't think they do anything. I, well, I think they only produce press releases and then <laughs> shares. So, so somehow they're generating $10 million selling maybe trinkets or uh, maybe um, something in their in their corporate store. And then uh, Kazamprom is, let's see here. <clears throat> God, so they're... they're uh, Two and a half billion dollars of, of sales. Yeah, but that number is going to be much higher based on current uranium pricing. Hmm. And and so even so, even though their mines are one hundred percent Kazakhstan, what's their geographic sales exposure look like? Well, I mean, they're they're selling uh, around the world. Anyone who needs uranium, uh, obviously, what happened with Russia has impacted them because they used to uh, export through uh, Saint Petersburg. So. You know, they're, they're landlocked, uh, but they're still selling about half their capacity to the Chinese. And they'll figure out how to sell the rest of it back to the Western world like it had been in the past. I mean, they have a joint venture with Kaz Adam, with, with uh, Cameco's. They've been selling, you know, out through there. Um, you know, they, they have agreements with uh, the French. Like, I think eventually they're going to supply anyone who needs the physical commodity. Yeah, got it. Cool. Um Awesome. Is there um, is, is there another theme that you wanted to talk about? We sort of went from energy to uranium. Yeah, let's talk about uh, U.S. housing. Um, you know, I think people have uh, really overdone uh, this interest rate thing. Uh, you know, thirty-year uh, mortgage is moved. I get it, uh, but um, it's adding a couple hundred dollars uh, a month to your mortgage, and in the end, um, you know, people have to live somewhere. <sighs> You know, the, the world before 2008, the United States used to produce more than a million single family units a year. Uh, then for more than a decade, we produced six to 800,000. And uh, now, uh, you know, there's about a 5 million unit catch up needed because the population grew and people my age are having kids and they're leaving uh, cities or, uh, you know, they're going to suburbs or more likely than that, they're, um, you know, leaving uh, high tax states like California and the Northeast and they're going to low tax states like Florida and Texas. And so, you know, there's more than a 5 million unit catch up and someone has to build these homes. Um, and, you know, the, the home builders have been absolutely destroyed in the last six months on interest rate fears. And, you know, I don't think it's uh, realistic um, in, in terms of what's happening versus, you know, the valuations of these companies. Uh, but, you know, I'm not owning the home builders. Uh, home building is just a terrible business. Uh, you know, it's very capital intensive. You're selling something today and you're taking margin risk and, you know, delivery risk and all these other risks. So like, it's just an awful business. And that's why at the bottom of the cycle, these things always struggle. Instead, I own a company called Builders First Stores. Uh, the ticker is BLDR. Um, and uh, they're, they're the largest distributor of uh, supplies to the housing industry. Uh, and it's an unusually good business. Uh, it's actually an incredibly good business in terms of return on capital. I mean, you can see what the chart did. Uh, during a time when the housing industry is pretty moribund, uh, you know, these guys made a ton of money for, coming out of 2012, you know, 13, and you know, they're still making a lot of money. They have a massive buyback in place. They've done a couple of pretty uh, dramatic acquisitions that have changed the business. But you know, I think this is a structural, you know, 20, 25% return on capital business with a few turns of debt. Uh, just, it, 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 it's just an amazing business with a massive buyback. And, you know, obviously, it's a, you know, new housing starts is what's driving, uh, you know, the demand for the products. But um, I think housing starts stay high. And as a result, I don't have to care, you know, what uh, commodity prices do, lumber, resin, I mean, it's a little tied to lumber, but um, 
in, in the end, I just have to care that they keep uh, building homes and someone you know brings the things to the job site. And so uh, interesting. So housing starts like we know that there's been sort of a housing boom over the past year. Uh, they're still way below what they were in sort of 2005, 2006. Uh, right. So, and, and, and so and we've been underbuilding uh, during all this time. And then how um, how does builders uh, first source, how do they get impacted by inflation to the extent that there's sustained inflation for the rest of the year? Oh, it's really good for them. Unlike, you know, if you own a home builder, uh, you sell, you, you, know, you, you fix the price of the home and then you have six months or a year, you have to deliver the thing and inflation works against you. It squeezes your margins. Here with Builders First Source, uh, they just sell the components. It's, uh, you know, pretty rapid inventory turns. And so when you have inflation, your, your SG&A sort of stays fixed and your, your net gross margin dollars uh, expands. And so the, the net result is massive profitability. Um, I think it trades at like five times, four times earnings for a business that's, like I said, better than 20 return on capital with a few turns of debt and all the cash goes into the buyback. Can you pull up a, a share count for mm-hmm. these guys? Because um, I think this is the most interesting thing. So they did a pretty uh, substantial acquisition in January of 21. And then ever since then, uh, they've just been hoovering up shares. I mean, they're buying back 5% of the shares outstanding each quarter effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're going to take the share count down to nothing. That's that's pretty cool. Let me see here. Repurchase a common stock. <clears throat> God, so they just really started uh, re, uh, ramping up this repurchase program. Yeah, they wanted to get a, a bunch of uh, integration of the merger done. You know, some of that stuff takes some capital. So, you know, they spent some money to integrate it. But, you know, if the shares are going to keep trading at five times earnings, they're going to just keep buying back the stock. And the, the, the net result is that uh, it's really accretive to shareholders. And uh, I think if the share price goes up, they'll slow down the buyback and they'll do acquisitions instead. Hmm. Um, interesting. And uh, I, I've heard you mention uh, St. Joe's before. Do you have a position or view on that right now? Yeah, that's my second largest position after uranium. Um, yeah, it's uh, one of the largest landowners in the state of Florida. Um, it's growing, you know, was it massively fast? Uh, uh, it's like 100% year over year revenue growth, like 200% uh, cash flow or EBITDA growth, whatever the metric you want to use. Uh, you know, it trades at about a quarter to a third of uh, net asset value. Um, and that the, the valuation is, I mean, look at that revenue growth. Um, and, but what's interesting is that the, the, the value, the net asset value is probably growing 15 to 20% a year. And so if you trade at a third of uh, fair value, you're picking up, you know, 40 Five percent growth. If it trades at you know a quarter and you, it's growing twenty percent a year, you're picking up eighty percent return on your money each year. Uh, and, and since they have such a great balance sheet, it's almost risk free. Uh, I just don't think you'll ever find anything else as attractive, just given how fast it's growing. I mean, this thing should trade at a premium to net asset value, not such a discount. And are they so they have a huge land bank? Are they developing the land themselves, or are they selling that off to for others to develop? Um, they're developing some of it for commercial real estate, but the vast majority of it, they're just uh, prepping lots and selling lots. I mean, they don't want to be in the capital intensive, terrible home building industry. They want to uh, prep lots with, uh, you know, almost zero cost basis and then sell them. Because once you prep the lots, you have this network effect where they, they build homes and you know, they're mostly selling you know, pretty high end stuff. I mean, a lot of the homes they're selling are past a million dollar price point. And then what you do is you build commercial real estate uh, adjacent to those homes and you get great values on that commercial real estate because everyone wants to be near rich guys spending a ton of money. And so they're taking timberland and they're making you know, the residual. I mean, they get, they're getting you know, a, a bunch of money out for the lots. And then the residual pad sites where they're building uh, commercial real estate, they're uh, maximizing that value as well. And so, you know, as you develop something, you add people, you add value to commercial real estate, then you go a mile inland, you repeat it. And then you leave some uh, legacy land you can develop five years later when there's more densification. But, you know, everything they do just increases the value of the 170,000 acres they have. Um, And so the value just keeps growing. Hmm. And then, so this is, uh, the stock was sort of famous uh, with David Einhorn uh, shorting it over here. And and he was right. And and he was right. Uh, So what's kind of like, um, maybe you could contrast sort of this time uh, or this time versus that time. Is it just the fact that so many more people are moving to Florida or what's going on now that's different? Well, 
you know, when, when David Einhorn was shorting it, they had a bunch of timber assets and the company was going nowhere fast. Uh, they changed management. I think it was 2016. And uh, the new guy, uh, George, is really doing a great job. He's, you know, he's, he's shrank the SGA and he's focused on recurring revenue, whereas prior management just was building homes and flipping them. And so as soon as you flip it, you have nothing. You have some cash in your hand. You got to put that money into building the next home. Whereas, you know, what they're doing now is they're selling the lots to someone else and using the cash to buy commercial real estate or build commercial real estate. So you have this recurring revenue stream. You also just have a lot more population. You know, it, it's this kind of chicken and egg thing. Uh, you want guys to buy, you know, multi-million dollar homes, but no one wants to go to the panhandle if, you know, you don't have amenities. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have good restaurants. You don't have uh, health care. You don't have schools. You don't have, you know, all the things that people need. And so it just took a long time to hit this critical mass because it's chicken and egg. You know, you don't want to go there and build a, a nice restaurant. There's no people to, sh to eat at your restaurant. And mm -hmm. finally hit this critical mass where you have a center of gravity and it's all working. I mean, I think the best metric you can look at is uh, the airport. And, you know, just take out uh, COVID that year. Uh, it, it's grown uh, passengers 30% a year at the airport. And it, it just shows you how many people are now moving to the panhandle and using the airport and, you know, obviously living there, but also tourism. And so it took a long time, but now it's just ramping. And I think that revenue growth number really shows you what's happening. That's awesome. Uh, do you have a, um, uh, a price target or kind of a number in mind in terms of valuation where you think this could trade to? Well, I think it's worth a couple hundred today, but I, I think ultimately, you know, that value keeps growing. So it'll trade well beyond that. I mean, I think eventually this will get valued at a premium to net asset value, but uh, I don't really do price targets. I, I, I'm an inflection investor. So I think what's really important here is that I bought the, my shares in the summer of 2020 because uh, it was obvious that the business was inflecting. Uh, if you look at uh, a bunch of metrics, you know, go to the county clerk and just look at uh, lot sales or you know, uh, home valuations or population growth, like a bunch of metrics finally started inflecting. So we bought ours at about 18, 19 bucks. I bought right at the inflection. And I'm going to stay with this as long as the trend is in motion. Uh, you know, I'm an inflection investor. I buy inflections because I take almost no risk because if it doesn't inflect, the expectations are so low, you get your money back. And if it does inflect, you just stay with it while it keeps inflecting, unless the valuation gets silly. The valuation is clearly not silly. And I just, I mean, I don't know how epic the inflation is going to be caused by all the money printing. So it's hard to know just how much, how high this goes. I'm just going to stay with it because I think it's probably the best way to hedge my portfolio against money printing. Yeah. And you definitely see that inflection, at least in revenue of being flat uh, up until 2020. And this is kind of the inflection that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I mean, you could go to the county clerk or you could talk to local realtors there and brokers or I mean, you could talk to the com company too, but I'm not usually a company talker. I'd rather get, you know, independent third party stuff. And in, in the end, it was obvious that things were dramatically changing there. I mean, I've been following this company for five years and things had been had been changing for a couple of years, but it just dramatically inflected in 20. And of course, you know, the, the way the real estate cycle works is that stuff that happens, you know, now doesn't show up into revenue until 23. You know, you sign a contract and there's, there's a lag to it. So what we saw in 20 is what, you know, you saw in revenue in 21. What we see now in the backlog, we're going to see in 22 and stuff there, you know, just, you know, starting today, you'll see in 23. But the, the, the backlog and pipeline of stuff is really quite impressive. I, I think that revenue growth just accelerates. Cool. Super interesting. Um, awesome. Well, those are all uh, uh, really intriguing um, and exciting ideas. I'm going to have to check some of these out for, for my PA because uh, definitely looks like the trend is your friend for a lot of these and sounds like the story is going to be here with us for a long time. The trend um, is your friend always. The, the, tr the trend is your friend always. Uh, so closing uh, question for, for people on the show is just if you have an episode, a uh, show or a movie that you've watched or been watching over the past couple of weeks or months uh, and, they, and you want to pitch that or recommend it to people. Now's the time. An episode. What do you mean? Oh, sorry. Like a TV show. So I've been watching we crash the we work movie. I think it's fabulous. Oh, uh, So uh, uh, yeah. So it has to be, um, has to be uh, uh, that has like Netflix or Hulu or, or whatever it is. 
or maybe you're just too busy talking to the county clerk and you're not watching. Uh, yeah, no, I'm too busy. If I had free time, uh, this, this is a show. It's an archaeology show uh, in the UK about a decade ago t- called Time Team, and they just resurrected it on Patreon. And uh, so I, I, I've given them some dollars to support them doing uh, archaeology in uh, the UK. But there's over 100 episodes on uh, YouTube if you want to go check them out. I, I'm kind of an archaeology nerd, so I get a kick out of it. Cool. What's it called? Time Team. Time team. Cool. Sounds awesome. Never heard of it. We'll definitely check it out. Um, awesome. Cuppy, thanks so much for, for your time and sharing all these ideas with me. Um, sure. And with happy our audience. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Hey, talk soon. Take care, guys.